Hi everybody, thanks a lot for coming along uh, this afternoon. Um, apologies, we've had a few cancellations, but uh, I thought we'll just get on with it if anybody comes in they can actually join us later. For those of you who've been here for the first time, the main aim of the construction network really is to, create, uh, is to try and create a kind of community of organisations which include the trades, suppliers and experts um, to sort of help you benefit your business. I mean, we kind of think that in terms of, of let's say, networking for construction, it's kind of unique. Um, so um, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is um, see, generally help you benefit your business. So I'll stop at that. So one of the things we've also got is an incentive scheme. Now what you've got in front of you is these. Okay. So if you know of any construction companies, if you get, if you can either bring them along and they join, we'll give you hundred pounds. If they join and pay the direct debit, we'll give you hundred pounds after being members so for like say three months. So effectively four members, you've got a free membership. Also, if somebody comes along and has one of these and it's got Gavin S. Burger's name in it, um, we'll, 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 we'll like to take that as red and that'll be part of the incentive right scheme as well. So I don't know if you want any as well, Joe, to look past them. Incentive scheme well, Gavin, applies to everybody. Yeah, the incentive scheme applies to everybody um, and we'll quite have to reward you. Um, I think the idea of this is that really what we're trying to do, as I say, is trying to get more members in. We are not from the community, so it's harder. And we need the community to come along and have a good experience. One thing you do get, uh, actually as a member, is, as you can see, everything's, everything's like a video, all the presentations are kept. So you can go back and look at all the presentations time and time again. The experts are there on the tap if you need uh, able to use them. And on the suppliers page, we've also got some discounts. If you want to be a supplier, one of the things we say to people is, you get a free listing, but um, we expect the members to get some kind of reward for for you being on there. Okay. So last month, last month I talked about target like setting. I just want to spend a couple of minutes because everything when we talked last month about the target like setting, everybody sets targets, set targets for margin or waste or whatever. The hardest thing is to embed these targets. And I was having a conversation on LinkedIn Messenger with one of my clients the other day, and they, it was in the evening, and he said, we need to look at vision and values, Grant. And I have not asked him what was the straw that broke the camel's back, because I've been talking about him, I've been talking about these with him for months. And something's happened that was, tipped him over the edge. And sometimes embedding stuff in our business is hard. It's hard enough when you've got employees, but employees are easier because you've got contract of employment, you've got all this extra stuff that you can say, this is the way we do things. If you want to continue to work here, this is what we expect. Subcontractors, however, are more difficult. And we almost need to sell them into the opportunity. And sometimes we do that based on the fact that we think they're just in it for the money. And they're not always just in it for the money. Some of them are, and we'll go down the road for an extra pound a meter or whatever. But 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 like so loads of others are in for the long term security that being a subcontractor to your business can actually give them. And so that helps to kind of buy them in. So some of the things that I just get to think about is look at your subcontractors, look at your employees, look at your vision and values. Are they living them? Because yeah, because if they're not, they're the ones that's going to cause the issues on site. And so that's what I get to think about. I'm happy to have a chat to you about it. I'm only going for long because I want to get to Joe, because <laughs> Joe's got far more good stuff than I've got. Okay, so um, I've got your presentation on here, Joe. Oh, right, right yeah. So next month, I've been talking to a guy this morning called Simon Cayman, and he's going to come in and talk about procurement and helping you to buy better. To, 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 to look at the different ways of doing it. Also, had a really interesting conversation with him this morning around a concept he has about having a like, materials hub that he wants to trial with us, which will give us, as a group, a whole different buying power. And he's going to talk, he's going to talk uh, well, next, next month about that. Now, we're very lucky we have Joe back. Uh, jo was with us a couple of months ago and talked about public sector tendering and she's now going to talk to us about a whole new ball game, which is private sector tendering. Okay, Joe?
이게 Thank you. Okay, so private sector tendering, which is a bit of a dark art. Um, those of you, actually, it was only Gavin that was here when I did the public sector tendering one. Um, the problem with the public sector is there's so many rules and regulations. At the same time, that's the benefit of that. Is that you know which rules you've got to stick to, you know exactly what they want from you and what you need to do to win the contract. Um, private sector, obviously, they can do whatever they want. It's their own, it's their own business. So um, how do you come tackle it best? Sorry, it says Sarah Hayes, by the way. She, um, she's ill, so she can't be here today. But. So what do I mean by public sector and private sector? So public money, basically, so this is taxpayer money. So schools and universities, councils, local authorities, hospitals, housing associations, anything that uses taxpayer money. Um, if a contract is, in a nutshell, worth more than 30,000-ish pounds per year, um, they have to put it out through the public sector tendering system. Anything below that, really, you can lump it in with private sector. They, they come do their own rules, really. So private businesses, hotels like this one, gym chains, um, home builders like Barrett, and it's way too small, you can't see, but any public sector contracts won by large contractors that are then divided up and put out to tender for, for you guys, basically. They obviously, since they've already won the work themselves, they can dish it out using their own rules. So what is so difficult about tendering in the private sector? Well, as I said, basically because there are no rules, it's obviously a lot harder to find. So, I mean, I don't know if you kind of are in the situation sometimes where you go, I'd love to work for that organisation, but I've no idea how to get under their, you know, their radar, um, find out how they would invite me to tender. So it is harder to find. The opportunity also may not be real. So I don't know if you've ever had this before where somebody's approached you, asked you to put in a tender or an RFQ or, or you know anything like that, a proposal, and actually nothing has come of it at all afterwards. So sometimes, for various different reasons, that contract opportunity might not have been a really real opportunity and you've then wasted your time. Some of the reasons there is because the budget isn't in place. So public sector, if it's public money, they have to have assigned the budget to the contract before they put it out to tender. So you know that if you win the work, you uh, are going to get paid for the work. Obviously, if it's private business, they don't have to do that. They might kind of decide they want your services. They ask you to tender for it, and then they go, actually, we haven't got enough money to do that. So again, could be a waste of time that way. Also, they might borrow all of your good ideas. So obviously, they've then gathered up loads of tenders that they've asked people, tell us about what you do. They've got all of that information up then they don't have to ask you to do the work. They can either do it themselves or give all of that information to somebody else to do. So that, that is a risk that way. They also can award the work to whoever they like, could be seen as a, a pro as well. Uh, but what it means is just because your proposal is better than everybody else's doesn't mean that they have to give you the work. Um, and often there is no defined layout guidance and questions to answer. So they might say, Give me, a, give me a proposal, tell me what you can do, and you sit there and you go, I don't really know what to tell them, what do I send them, what do I include? But that can also be one of the great things about tendering in the private sector, because there is so much more room for negotiation and influence, taking people to play golf, for example, <laughs> as we discussed earlier. Um, and you cannot do that with public money, but you can if it's private business. So if you know the person, there is the opportunity to influence what they're looking for, to influence the process, um, and also to negotiate, so whether that be financially or in terms of the, the contract or the service that you're providing. You can also talk to them as much as you like about the opportunity. So public money, you cannot talk to them other than through the defined messaging portal. Um, obviously private business, you can just have a chat with them and kind of change maybe the tender. You can ask them exactly what it is they're looking for. Um, what do you want me to say, for example? You could ask them that. Um, you're free to do whatever you like there. And also, they might tell you what they want you to do to get the contract. So I bet that's probably happened at some point to everybody here. They said, I need you to put a tender in, but basically say this and the work's yours. So they're absolutely allowed to do that. And you have much more flexibility in terms of your response. So response as in physical response so what you send them back um, if you want to include a piece of information that they haven't necessarily asked for you're free to send that to them obviously 
public money, uh, with public tendering opportunity, you can't do that, you might risk being disqualified. So, some tips then for tackling that. First of all, where do you find those opportunities? So this isn't a marketing uh, presentation, so I'm just going to touch on these really briefly, but um, you can just ask them about the procurement practices. So, you know, if it's an, a large organisation that you've identified, you really want to work with them, but you need to find out how. So you could just um, call them, call the, the help desk, or maybe look up on LinkedIn, who is the head of procurement, that kind of thing. If you've got a contact there, just ask them who works in procurement there and then once you've spoken to them how do you appoint contractors do you have a, a preferred supplier list or do you just take my contact details now and then if something comes out do you let me know there's no harm in asking and i think quite often because people um aren't sure of the differences between public sector tendering and private bidding um people hold back from asking questions because I think I might get in trouble for asking that or I might annoy the buyer. Um, actually, in this situation, you're fine to do that. So there is no issue to kind of just call them up and say, I want to work with you in future. How, how am I going to go about doing that? Um, so also using sites like LinkedIn, that kind of thing. Professional stalking, guys, it's really, really useful. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make a point? Yeah, go on. Has anybody in the room got a company that they really like to do work for? that you can think in your mind that yeah. you'd like to work for them, yeah. right? So actually think about, if you, I think if you think about it in those terms, definitely, it might be a... And certainly then for LinkedIn, so if you know that, if you know that company, go on LinkedIn, Google I'm head of procurement or procurement and the, and the company, um, and it probably will come up with that, or head of buying, or you know that kind of thing, contracts manager, um, and it will give you a contact there. And there is no harm. What's the harm in sending that person a message and just being blunt about it and saying, you know, I want to work with you. How, how does that work? Do I need to contact somebody? Um, the worst that they can do is ignore your message. Um, the best thing they can do is say, yeah, totally email me your details. Next time we put a tender out, I'll send it over to you. So, and then you're you're on. Um, also, attend events that target buyers might be at. So. I kind of, uh, through my job, I hear of these events all the time, so public sector ones and private, there might be big kind of trade shows, that kind of thing. So part of my job, I always tell people about them and say, do you know this is happening, you might want to go to it. And you would not believe how many times people say to me, oh no, that'll be for the big boys, I, you know, that's out of my sight, I, there's no point in me going to that. Right, but surely the person that you want to supply to, that's them then, they're going to be there, aren't they? <laughs> So go to that event, and yes, absolutely, it might not immediately be of interest to you that it might be too big for you or not exactly what you do, but all those other attendees are your potential networking and potential contacts, aren't they? So if you've got somebody in your business that can spare just an hour or something to go to these events, also, if you've already looked them up on LinkedIn, they might have advertised via LinkedIn that they're going to that event. Get there then, get stalking. Get yourself there, get a conversation going, you know, that's the best way, isn't it? They're, they're there, they're ready to talk about work, so, you know, there you go, you're in with them that way. I'd, so just, then, I'd just like to say, if anybody yeah, wants to go golfing... <laughs> <laughs> Put it on LinkedIn. I'm quite happy to say that. <laughs> so then just your generic marketing as well. I know that you've probably had sessions about this and that people bang on about it all the time, but it is so important. Keep your website up to date, you know? The first thing somebody's gonna do, especially in private business, if they are looking for somebody to deliver a service for them, and perhaps they don't have a list of, of preferred suppliers, or perhaps they want to add people to that, the first thing they will do is Google you. And if your site looks stagnant or out of date, they'll think the business is folded, they'll think that you're not on top of stuff, there's no attention to detail, so definitely get your website up to date. And use social media for PR. I don't obviously mean your own personal Facebook page, but if you set one up for your business, um, then definitely use that. Everybody kind of loves a bit of that. Has anyone here heard of um, Nest Egg Properties or Nest Egg Developments yes. in Leeds? Yeah. So they are um, on a building site opposite my office at the moment. And obviously, everyone in the office is being lonely. What's going on? What are they doing there? First thing I did is Google it and it came up with their Facebook profile. We're all now following them because we want to know what's happening because we're now sitting to the thing over the road. But also it means that if anybody in my office says, hey, do you know a local development company? Yeah, I do, because it's on my personal, it's on my newsfeed, you know, every single day I'm being reminded with little photos of progress, that kind of thing. So definitely, you, get, you know, set up a, a company page, it doesn't have to be Facebook, does it? it can be LinkedIn and stuff, but keep doing that and keep promoting the stuff that you're doing. And entering awards, so again, loads of people um, 
kind of ignore awards, I think because they think that they are for larger organisations or perhaps that they are fixed um, or that they're expensive. But uh, sometimes all of those things are true. <laughs> Other times that they're really not. So quite a lot of them nowadays are free to enter. Um, you don't have to attend the event site if you don't want to. Um, quite often I hear through work that there aren't many entries for awards. So they want people to enter them. And if you do enter the award, you don't have to write it, I can do that for you, or anybody else you know, with kind of business writing skills can do that. They can write you up an award entry, submit it, and if you are shortlisted or win, you can use that logo and that piece of information on your proposals, on your professional bids and tenders, on your website, on your social media. There's kind of endless PR opportunities that, again, are going to get you visible to your potential buyers. Um, also attending networking events, obviously you guys can see the value in that because you're here, but um, it's that age-old thing, isn't it? It doesn't necessarily matter who's in the room at the time, it's a matter of who they know and their contact list. So. Okay, so what is the process in the private sector? I mean, <coughs> this is an example, but the whole point really is that they don't have a defined process. So it could be all of this and more, or it could be none of it. Um, but classic example here, so where a formal process is followed, they will probably do a market scan and that is them uh, either looking at their list of preferred suppliers or as we said doing a Google, looking on LinkedIn, asking people who do you think would be good at providing this work. Then they will issue an RFI, do you all know what an RFI is? Request of information. Uh, followed by an ITT, invitation to tender, or an RFQ, request for quotes. To be honest they're all interchangeable, doesn't really matter which one of those you use. Uh, but they will probably then issue that out to you. So that's your instructions of here's what they want you to do. They want you to respond to this, this bit now. Then they will evaluate it, maybe, or maybe not, because this is private business. So they don't have to. If they get all of those bids in and go, actually none of these are what I was looking for, then actually they don't have to bother evaluating any of them. Equally, they might already know really who they wanted to give it to, um, so you've got to bear that in mind. It's not the same as it is with public money, public sector procurement, they have to evaluate them all fairly, they have an evaluation methodology and they have to give you that feedback. In the private sector they don't have to do that, um, but still ask obviously because feedback is really, really important. And the same goes for awards, they don't necessarily have to award that contract, um, but if they do, that's great for you because then you can probably do a bit more, more negotiating afterwards, which you can't do in the public sector. So let's say you, uh, you've you decided, right, I want to start getting out there and I want to start responding to some of these RFIs. You need to get yourself bid ready first. I know we talked about this in the um, public sector presentation, but basically the same rules apply and they apply just to your business in general to get you kind of ready to, for action. Um, the first one is case studies. Um, I go on about this all the time because the power of case studies, oh my God, they're so important. You can tell people how good you are all the time if you show them with a photograph and a quote from the person you've done it for, they can't really argue with that. If you can write up a really nice, concise case study of a piece of work you've done, um, the power of that is more than anything that you can write in terms of a, a written response or a method statement. So have a little think about the work that you have previously done. Can you kind of form that in preparation for any of this? Can you kind of create some case studies? or perhaps the work that you're doing right now, do you need to be thinking about taking photos of them? The stuff that seems really boring to you on a daily basis actually might look quite nice in a case study. Um, so make sure you're doing that, make sure you're asking for little testimonials from people. It doesn't have to be, give me a testimonial, because then people go, oh, 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 I don't really know what to say. So one of the things that we do in, in our business is I'll say, can you give me, you know, out of 10, what would you score us for this? Or perhaps can you tell us were you pleased with us, what were you most pleased about, and you know, that, that kind of thing. So give them a little bit of a hint, and they just need to give you a little snippet back that you can put on your case study. Also, KPIs. So, so often I hear people say, oh no, there weren't any KPIs for that contract. Right, all that means is that the buyer hadn't issued you with any KPIs, and so they weren't measuring you against any, but why couldn't you have set them yourself? So do that, because if you, you know, when you're putting them in your case study, you don't need to state whose KPIs they are. You just need to say, for this piece, this piece of work, these were our KPIs and this is how we scored. So maybe delivered 100% of presentations, zero absence, you know, that, that kind of thing. Or, you know, just 
if you're not being dictated by uh, to, you know what you've got to be measured by, make it up yourself and record it, and then you can use it in your case studies. Social value as well. So the importance of social value in this this kind of aspect is that the the buying organisation will have some sort of corporate, like you said, vision of values, probably including something to do with social value. If you do any sort of social value initiative as a subcontractor to them or a provider to them, they can claim that as their own. So that is brilliant from their point of view because it's free ticks in the, in the good box, basically. So anything that you do, whether it is a really, really small thing like in your office, perhaps you use recycled paper, perhaps you, um, I don't know, have recycling bins in your office, or perhaps bigger initiatives that you've got, like taking on an apprentice or um, doing presentations at a local like school for education days, that kind of thing. Anything like that, document that, get it written up into a little social value piece, and make sure you're telling people about it, because they'll love it, because for them, that's a really lazy way to say that in our supply chain, we promote social value. Tick, done, because they'll love that. Also, keep your construction line profile up to date, people, honestly. I think uh, there's a really bad habit in this industry of um, applying, getting it done, and then not touching it for ages. And you've got to remember that the point of that is so that people can refer to that really easily. They don't have to contact you about it. They don't have to ask you to send them anything. They can really easily look at your profile. And quite often in tenders now, they will say, put your ID in so that they can log on and have a look. So um, definitely make sure that you are keeping them up to date. You can pay people to do that as well. We do it. I'm sure other, other kind of marketing companies or whatever would do that. So good tip there. Um, also know your competition. So. It's kind of what you were saying about identifying people you want to be providing to. Also, physically write down five top, you know, your kind of top list of your competition. Who are they and what are their strengths and weaknesses? And then use that to your advantage. I know Gab does this because when we're looking at bids and tenders, you'll say to me, these are the people I think are going to go for it. And these are their strengths and weaknesses. Therefore, this is what I think they're saying. So we need to say something different because there is no point competing for the same thing unless obviously your miles better in that area. You need to identify what can you provide that's different to your competition. We call that your win theme. Um, and then that's your strong point. That's what you want to push there. So it might be that you're um, perhaps a smaller business and can therefore give them more personalised attention, that kind of thing. So then, when you are completing your bid, it's really, really difficult, I know, because they'll say to you, send me a tender or send me a proposal, and you kind of think, oh, what, what am I going to put in there? And so many people then just cut and paste something, get it sent off. It doesn't really answer what they, you know, the question they were being asked. And also, it doesn't represent your business to the, the best of your ability. So, make sure you do ask questions if you don't have enough information. So many times people approach us to help them write these bids, and I'll go, where's the spec? And they're like, no, no, that's all we've been sent. So ask for more. <laughs> because that's just laziness on the buyer's point of view there. They just haven't bothered writing up more, or perhaps they've forgotten to send it to you. But if you can't respond properly because you don't know exactly what's involved, ask for it then. That's a simple question, isn't it? You can't go wrong with that. So if you don't know, ask and get more information. Identify your win themes for that customer as well. So whoever it is that you are hoping to provide to, have a quick, again, stalking, but have a quick look on their website or on their LinkedIn. What are they really trying to push at the moment? So is it social value? Or maybe they're making a big deal recently about um, environmental stuff. Or, you know, what is it that they've been promoting? Because you know that that's key for them and their initiatives. So write about what you do in that same arena because that's something they're focusing on at that time. So obviously it's going to be a winner. Take your time, do not rush over these things. I know that if somebody says to you, tell me what you do, it's really tempting to then just quickly respond. But if you are competing with other businesses who have a big team, perhaps like myself, we wouldn't rush that. And so your response is gonna look really shoddy <laughs> next to a professionally written proposal. So really don't be tempted to rush your response, take your time with it. And make sure that you include value but not marketing waffle. So the difference between those two things, I know sometimes it can be kind of difficult to identify what's, the, what's good stuff to include and, what, and what's bad, what's waffle. Well, really I would say anything that adds value when they're reading it. So if we've identified that they're pushing on their website loads of their environmental credentials at the moment, telling them about your environmental credentials is going to add value. 
including your brochure that they haven't asked for is not going to add value. That doesn't give them any benefit at all. Including your case studies to say, here's exactly where we've done this work before and look at some great photos and some testimonials, does add value. It shows them, you wanted to know, can I do this? And I'm telling you, yes, I can. But like I say, including a flyer about some other thing that you can provide does not add value at all. So don't, don't include waffle, they'll just get annoyed with it. And the more you give people, the less they'll read. So it, it's, it's just not worth it. Um, and then review it. So um, <laughs> quite often, one of the services we provide is, is reviewing people's proposals. Quite often people will say, I think it's absolutely fine, but they'll give us to look at it anyway. Now, my job, and probably the job of somebody who is um, in charge of giving out the contracts and, and evaluating these things, is all about words and writing. So I am a real stickler for grammar and punctuation and spelling and presentation. It's just the type of person that I am to have this type of job, which is gonna be the same for the buying organization. So for me, if I receive something, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so if I receive something that has those mistakes in, that annoys me and I don't like that as much. So although, you know, maybe you lot are great with, with spelling grammar and all that kind of thing, but if you're not, <laughs> like it, um, <laughs> make sure you do send it to somebody like me because although you might not think it's a big deal, you might go, well, I get what I'm trying to say, right? But actually, for somebody like me, that has a negative impact there. I'm gonna go, I don't like this, it's not right, they haven't even got someone to check it, you know? It can have really, really big impact. So we do it, again, lots of marketing people do it, maybe someone in your business, you can just say, look, half an hour, just literally just read through it and just kind of check it for punctuation, layout, presentation, that kind of thing, really. And then conduct an internal lessons learned session. So this is after you've then sent it off. So do this straight away. So quite often, you know what it's like, you get some sense out the door and you think, I don't even want to speak about that. I don't want to see it for another you know, couple of weeks. But actually, that is the time to sit there and actually go, did I, did I do what I was meant to do there? I asked somebody to help and they didn't help me. Or I wanted to put in a case study but didn't have the case study bring up. So do a really, really quick jot down on a piece of paper, lessons learned review. Maybe you've identified some bits of information that you wish you'd had written up and you didn't have to hand and then act on those straight away because it's much better to have it done in preparation for next time rather than next time comes around and you go, oh my God, why didn't I learn? I knew I didn't have this. So lessons learned. And then gathering feedback. So public sector tendering, you are entitled to a breakdown of feedback. That's what we were talking about earlier. And um, they should tell you exactly what, like how you scored, why you scored that way, what was missing and what was great. In private business, they do not have to tell you so you might not get feedback. But on the flip side, if they do give you feedback, they can be really, really candid about it and really open. So they might just say, oh, you know that person, your competitor, they said this. And that's so invaluable. It's from the horse's mouth, you know exactly what other people said. So definitely ask for the feedback. Again, there's no harm in asking, is that the worst they can say is, I haven't got time to do that, sorry. Fine. Um, the best they can do is go, yeah, here was the winning bid. <laughs> you know, they're allowed to do that. It's private business. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and give me something extra as well. So then create your action plan. It's the same sort of thing that we were talking about. Once you've got some feedback, make sure that you create an action plan. There's no point requesting the feedback and then doing nothing with it, obviously. You're never going to get better, but any of your competitors who have acted on their feedback will get better. So you're going to be stagnant as they're always improving. So make sure that you're acting. The other option, pay someone to do it we do it there's other people that do it as well this isn't solely a sales pitch for me here the point i'm trying to make is if it's not your strength don't waste your time there really is that's quite literally a waste of your time but also it's pointless really so maybe there's somebody else in your business who would be better placed to do that you might think oh but i you know i know the most about it so i'm best to do it but actually if it's not your strength you know, that's, that's a waste of everybody's time. Or, let's say, pay somebody else to do it. We do it, we have a win rate of more than 75%. Statistically speaking, according to surveys, if you do it yourself, your win rate is about 10%. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't do anything if I was only successful 10% of the time. So um, that's kind of reason enough. Also, return on investment using us is um, usually more than a thousand pounds for every pound spent. Um, so, 
again, you can't really argue with that. A lot of people are quite scared at this stage. They kind of say, well, I don't want to pay somebody to write these proposals for me because it's such a huge chunk of all that work. Do you really want to mess it up just because you didn't want to, to delegate that opportunity? So if you do want more of a chat about this, the thing with, with private sector bidding is obviously because there are no rules, every opportunity is going to be completely different. So the best time to discuss this really is the next time you get sent an RFI or RFQ. You can just contact us, you've got my card and some details on offer. Uh, we don't charge for that kind of thing. We will easily talk through um, what you've been sent, how we think you should approach it, or perhaps you've already been writing them and um, you just want a bit of feedback on what I think, you know, if I think there's some areas for improvement. We're happy to do that and we don't charge. And we are doing an offer for you guys. Um, we were talking about bid readiness, so getting your kind of your finances, we talked about this in the previous presentation, getting your financial um, <coughs> kind of background up to scratch, your accreditations, your case studies, all that kind of thing. And um, we will happily either come to you and sit there for an hour or you can come to us and we will look through everything you've got um, and talk about how ready we think you are to be to be bidding and also what we think you can do to, to kind of move that on to the next step. Any questions? Got loads. Okay, right. <laughs> go. Um, one of the things is, I've, I've, I used to work for a construction company that isn't in existence anymore. Okay. Because they used to bid for everything. <laughs> because the danger was, it's a, there's a client that we work for, client we want to work for, we have to bid. Okay. And so the difference between the bids they wanted to win and the bids they didn't want to win were chalk and cheese. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve that? So it depends, what was that, public or private or bit of both? Bit of both. Okay, so I think the danger with private is that people, I mean, we love to take a compliment, don't we? So I think people think if you're sent an RFI, if somebody says, please tell me how you could solve this problem, people love to believe they want us to do this work. I think you have to be quite brutal with yourself. And so in that situation, it's very easy to go, well, they want us to do it. They, they've asked us, they've asked us to respond. So of course we're gonna respond. I think you do have to be quite brutal with yourself. Um, and bear in mind that actually it's just somebody's job to make sure that there was enough competition out there and to get enough proposals in. That doesn't necessarily mean that they specifically do want you to do the work. Even if they phone you and tell you that, because I hear that all the time, of course it's in their interest to make you think <laughs> that they want you to do the work. Of course they will, so sorry guys, but they're probably lying to you. Um, and even if they do want you to do the work, if somebody else comes and does it cheaper, they're gonna go for that, aren't they? Probably. So, I think you've gotta be quite brutal about um, win fees, basically. And that's to do with identifying your competition, isn't it? So identifying your competition and realistically thinking, why would we win this work? Why would they give it to us? Unless obviously they're your brother or something. Um, why would they give us this work? And there has to be, apart from price, there has to be some sort of win theme there. And you've got to look at your competition and think, is that a strong case? If it's not, it's a waste of time, isn't it? And we work with quite a lot of clients who are so busy bidding for everything that the really good opportunities, they know they're the best ones, they, they haven't even got time to go for them or to put enough effort in because they're just spread so thin. Um, so it really is about identifying the right opportunities rather than, than going for everything. In the public sector, um, obviously because there's more of a defined specification and outcomes, you can look more upon um, kind of your chances of winning balanced against the time investment on that and also looking at the specification more and thinking, do I, do I really want this work? Because obviously privately you can negotiate public sector you can't so if that specification is not absolutely ideal for you don't go for it because that's what you're going to sign up to do so um, yeah I can see attention to detail really weeding them out anybody else anybody got any questions for Joe? probably not because it depends on each depends on well, with the award ceremonies you mentioned yeah. something about you don't have to go well you know about putting yourself forward how can yeah. you find them I, I thought I just always thought companies would organise one or organisations would organise one. So there's, there's loads of them now because they're quite a good money making scheme, aren't they? Because you get people to pay to come to the event and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So there are lots of awards out there. Google, really. Um, there's, I mean, we do that as part of our service offering. So we monitor all of the award, types of awards that are out there. And if we think they're suitable for our um, clients, we'll say, hey, do you know this is there? Do you want to go for it? Um, 
So you can you can pay people to monitor that kind of thing, or you can just literally have a look. There's um, Wakefield Business Awards that I think have just closed actually. There's loads of kind of local ones like that. Um, and they're, they're usually pretty accessible as well. So I think people think it'd be this whole big old thing to try and enter the award. It's going to take loads of time. It's going to be really difficult. Actually, in my experience, if you're looking for local awards, they probably say, I don't know, 800 words, which is a page, um, on why you think you should win the award, which basically just means tell me whatever you think is great enough to be awarded. Um, and that kind of thing, it's pretty easy to go for. If you don't want to write it, it's very cheap to pay somebody to write that. Um, and then, yeah, even if you get, to be fair, being shortlisted is just as good as winning in terms of awards because shortlisted for the such and such business awards says the same thing, doesn't it? So, um, yeah, just have a look, see what's out there. The Chambers of Commerce as well. I don't know if you're a member of Chamber of Commerce, but even if you just look on their website, they have their own awards for their members, but they also quite often advertise um, to different awards. All right. Thanks, Joe. Right. I've got something, because it was interesting what you were saying there, Joe. I've got something I'd share with you. You might not see it very well on here, but um, it's something I'll certainly put on the members page of the site. And it was something we used to use when I worked in IT. And we had our sales guys, uh, we introduced them to a thing called TAS. Now, TAS stands for Target Account Selling, right? And so the TAS was really good because it enabled them, if I can find it on here, um, it enabled them to understand where they were in an opportunity. And in private sector tendering to me, it sounds very much, very much the same. It's about how you build a relationship with your target. So if you can just give me two ticks. I'm desperately trying to find this here. It probably won't come out very well because it's an Excel spreadsheet. Wait for that and effectively, what, what the TAS does is it helps you to understand everything you can about the client. So you're almost in their business with them. Right? And so it talks about actually, one of the things you talked about was actually, is there even an opportunity? Now, you're not going to see this very well, but it breaks itself down into this is what's called the TAS 1 to 20. Now what we have here is, oh, I can use pointer, that's quite exciting isn't it, I get it to work. So it breaks into four areas, right? Now the first one is, is there an opportunity, right? So the things it looks at here is, what do we understand about this client? Do we understand everything we, everything we need to know about them, right? And that's about the application and project for a start, what is it they want us to do, right? The, the 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 actual the actual company itself and the profile of the business who are they many staff have they got where do they exist where do they do work is this a local contract that, that great we we'll love that but is it a national it's a business that will give us a local contract and then in two months time we'll say oh by the way what are you going to be talking but I'm in a minute no we don't do that um, what's the financial condition so are you going to get paid now that used to scare our sales guys because I mean, we've had a meeting with them 10 minutes and we're asking them if we're going to get paid or not. But it was one of the things because it's a qualification tool and it helps you as much to qualify opportunities out as it does to qualify them in. Are we going to waste our time? Are we going to end up doing all of this stuff for no return? We need to know, right? So access to funds, that's the other thing. So if it's a big project, where's the money coming from? How's it being made available? Is it venture capitalist? Is it, is it cash being made at certain points of the project that you can only apply then? And the last thing here, and the most important thing is the compelling event, right? Now we used to talk about the compelling event, everybody else would say to talk about need. And Taz, you talk about the compelling event. What's driving it? What will happen if this project doesn't go ahead? Right? And that's all the things. And we used to have a team of, of let's say, lead generators, and that's all they did. Because you get phone calls on a Friday afternoon from an IT manager who was bored and waiting for the pubs to open or whatever, and they say, <laughs> Oh, we want to this fantastic new website, we want a network and what this, and they'd all get excited and dewy eyed because you get a little bit of, if it went on to a bit of business, they got paid on it, and they'd waste time and, oh, no, no, just ask them if they've got a budget. Oh, I've got a budget, I've got this, I've got that. No, no, well, come back once you've got it. But what it also enables you to do is it enables you to look at your competition. So where's your competition in this? What does what does my competition understand? 
Where are they? And, and private sector tenders, you can have these conversations. I think it makes you look far more professional because now what you've got is you've got a process. Now the second bit is, can we compete? So what is the formal decision-making criteria? What are they really going to have to go through? What's the hoops we're going to jump through to get it? Right? The next bit is, can we do it? Mm-hmm. Is it something we can actually deliver? Rather than going off on a flight of fantasy and think, oh, we might get a subcontractor. No, we can't. And you worked on the 80-20 rule, because you can negotiate on the 80-20 rule. Right? The third bit is, what's the sales resource requirement? How much work is it going to take us to get this? And is it worth it? The whole question you ask yourself through the ties is, is it worth it, is it worth it, is it worth it, I'm going to get it, right? The next one is, what's our relationship with the client? So if you've got a really good relationship with the client, our chances are, that'll be quite good. If we've got a struggling relationship with the client, what do we need to do to help us to form a better relationship, right? And we'll come on to that in a minute. So correct, Gavin. <laughs> and the last thing is unique business value, right? Now, the unique business value is a bit like, what's your USP? Things, yep. Now, I was at a meeting yesterday when everybody was talking about, what's your USP, what's your USP? And I said, I don't know, you need to go and speak to my clients. Mm-hmm. Because your unique business value, your USP is what your clients say about you. Not what you say about yourself. You can make, oh, that's why case, that's why when you were talking about the um, um, testimonials, to, to, testimonials yeah. it's the strongest thing. That's your client saying that, GNE is a fantastic company to work with. Signature bill, brilliant. Love Richard, true professional. That's what sells you. Completely waffle doing like that, that's what sells you. So your unique business value is what your clients say about you. Right? Somebody says that I'm the brains of the operation, they're in trouble. <laughs> the last bit is can we win? Right? So can we actually win this? Right? So do we have inside support? Do we have guys inside the client that actually love us and want to give us the work? Because right? that's a key thing. If we've not got inside support, how do we go about it? So getting inside support, what do we need to do to actually engage with this company? Executive credibility. Have we worked with them? Have we worked with them in the past? Do they like us? What do they like about us? Will, will their MD take our calls? Or do they say, oh, he's busy at the moment. Can you ring back? Or do you get straight through? That's executive credibility. Those are the things you're looking for. Cultural compatibility. So, actually, do we work the same way? Do we have the same vision and value? Mm-hmm. Culture, right? The next one is informal decision criteria. Which comes back to Gavin with you, taking them for a few beers. Taking them to the, we used to take companies to the golf, we used to get to the Grand Prix, we used to, we used to take a Dellen Road to Wembley, to all over the place cost us a bloody fortune, (laughs) but it worked, because that's where the work's done, that's where the business is really done, right? Now the last thing there is, politically aligned, are we politically aligned, are we talking to the people that will make the decision, or are we being hedged off somewhere, somewhere else, right? Now we had an opportunity with the FA, right, huge opportunity, and now the sales guy walked around like a tall dog for about three months, Ignoring meetings, ignoring training, ignoring, oh, I'm working with FA, I'm working with FA, right? And one of the things we got companies, one of the things we got the sales guys to do was we do like what's called a TAS review. And the first thing we say to them is, draw the organisation as you see it. And the idea was you draw the org chart. So I've got the MD here, I've got the directors here, this is the project team here, I'm talking in here, right? And this guy draw a box with the FA on it and another box with external consultants. And this had gone up to board level. This had, this had, the board was all behind, oh, they get the FA, fantastic. And the sales manager, when he, when he did this, the sales manager and I, the sales manager just head went on the desk. And oh, no. I said, are you going to tell the board or will I? Because he was nowhere near the FA. He had not even talked to anybody in the FA, he talked to this external consultant for months and getting precisely nowhere. But on the back of that, he was making a big thing of it. So, he was not politically aligned, not aligned anywhere. And so if we're not talking to the person who will make the decision or can help us to make the decision, we're nowhere, right? The last thing is, is it worth winning? Now this is a case of, is there gold in them, that hills? So, 
what's the short term value of this piece of the, 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 this opportunity? It may be a small job with a big client. So the example I've had, I did work with a construction company and we actually went through this exercise with them and they had two opportunities. One was for about three and a half million pounds in Manchester and the other one was for, uh, I think it was the Yorkshire Bank and it was a shed in the back garden of the AMD I think, right? It was worth about three grand, it was a big shed, right? And we went through this, but of course when we start going through this, all the things about this job in Manchester didn't stack up. There was no project, there was no details, there was no nothing, there was no this. They didn't even own the land. So eventually the one they went for was the, with, with, with actually with the Yorkshire Bank. Because it's clearly defined, there's a compelling event, we've got unique business value, it's clearly defined. And guess what? The short term value of this job is great. The future revenue could be enormous, right? The profitability is good. The degree of risk is low. It's a shed in the back garden. We can easily do that. The strategic value of being able to say we've got the Yorkshire Bank as a client is bloody enormous. Right? And this is what you should be thinking about. And as I say, I'll make this available on the members. We'll have this, we'll have this available on the members um, page. And there's, this is just the 1 to 20. There's a full TAS plan on there, which even tells you the questions you should be asking when you go to meetings. And I'll put that on the members page as well so you can have access to it. So when you're looking at private sector tendering, you've got a process that you can tick the box and say, yes, I know that, or that's strong, or that's weak, or I don't know. If you don't know, it's a question mark, and it's a question you need to ask them. Just, just in terms of asking questions as well, one of the things we haven't mentioned is um, so we've talked a lot about new contracts and new pieces of work, but actually if you're the, if, or, sorry, if there's an incumbent as well, so if there's a current provider doing this work, it's an ongoing requirement and they have put it out to tender. So it may be because they want to move away, but you don't know that. And so it's all about, like you said, asking the questions. So if there is somebody providing this work at the moment, you need to ask them why why are you going to move because there's a very real possibility that actually the reason they put it out to tender is to scare the current provider into reducing their price or just frankly being a bit better <laughs> that owes to shake it up that kind of thing so you that you really need to identify is is there actually a real chance like you put about kind of the the, the, um, the compelling event. Exactly, compelling event. So is there a compelling reason for them to move away from their current provider? Or actually, are they just trying to scare them? Or perhaps, you know, I talked about borrowing ideas. Do they want to <laughs> stick with their current provider, but perhaps say, well, so-and-so is doing this, and then the current provider will do that. So that's something that, again, like you just mentioned, yeah. you need to ask that right at the beginning. And that's that's a valid question. You know, you can't, people, like I say, they're so worried about asking, but actually, if you receive this invitation to tender or request for quote or whatever, and you know that somebody is currently doing the work, it's a very valid question to call them or see them, whatever, meet them, and say, are, are you really looking to move, and, and why? Because obviously they'll probably lie to you and say, yes, we are looking to move, but, but why? What's the reason? Um, I'm hoping that you would know that anyway. If this is an organisation that's been on your radar, you'll know who's currently delivering the service and you'll know word on the street is they've been messing it up or they're too expensive and they can't afford them anymore or their technology's failing, whatever. So it would be great if you knew anyway what the situation was. But if you don't, you need to ask and find out. You've got somebody doing it already. Why have you come out to tender? Are you frank, frankly, are you looking to cut costs, or do you want more technology, or are they just are they failing? You know, what's the actual issue? And obviously, then on that, like you said, you can then either qualify it out. You can say this is not worth it. There's no real opportunity. It's going to cost us a fortune to put a tender in. It's not really worth it. Bit of a gamble. Or you might say yes. We know that they have got somebody doing it already, but they're really messing up for X, Y, and Z. Therefore, we need to offer them the solution to those specific problems, and it is a real piece of work. So, yeah. And the fact of the matter is, if you can't get a compelling event, or you can't create yeah. one, then it. Steer clear. Avoid yeah. it like the plague. If, you're not, if they won't give you a unique business value, the chances are you're not going to win it. 
if you're not politically aligned with the person that will make the decision, the chances are you're not going to win it. If the strategic value is no good, steer clear, right? And the fact is that when we employed this in IT sales, it increased our sales order value by around 35% on the business because we negotiated. Now, the classic story I've got is with London Underground. We went to a big meeting with London Underground and all the competition was in the room. And they went through a presentation about this is a tender, this is a bid, this is what we're going to do. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Go to the end. Is there any questions? No. Silence. Right? And that was because nobody wanted to ask a question that would tip off your position. And we walked across the, 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 the underground offices at that point were just right opposite of the King's Cross. And by the time we left their office, walked across to get on the train to come back to leave, we decided we're going to know better. Right? Not for us. And on the train up, we walked on the email. Sales guy went back to his home office that night, sent an email saying, thanks very much, we're interested in meeting but it's not for us. It's an ugly baby, as we used to call it, right? And in the morning when he got, he had about 25 missed calls from his contact at Little London Underground saying, why are you not bidding for this? So I eventually rung him up and said, well, you know, so I've explained it in the email on why we're not bidding. It's just, we don't think it's manageable, I mean, for the budget you've got, we don't think we can do it, but blah, 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 blah. And he said, but you were our number one choice. What's wrong with it? If, if you don't think it'll work, you were the one we wanted to have it. So we went back in and renegotiated and got the deal based on not bidding. Because we didn't think it was right. And that's, a, that's another tactic to, to be able to use to say, don't think it's for us. Because it tests out your unique business value. And that's, that's, so it gives you data. And as I say, I'll, hap I'll happily let you share this along with the full task plan on the members page. You can go and look at it. It will help you when you're looking up tendering, particularly in the private sector, and it may work some of it in the public sector. Yeah, that's definitely so. The, yeah, the thing you need to ignore in the, in the public sector is the informal decision making criteria, because that ain't going to happen. Don't try it, you'll get yeah. it out. You'll get it out. <laughs> Don't do anything like that. Don't offer them a game of golf. Don't try and buy them coffee. Don't do anything. But everything else, though, really, in terms of that, can be kind of combined into we call it opportunity costs. Yeah, yeah. So which is all, encompasses all of these things, and that that applies to anything. It doesn't really matter where the money is coming from. If you are being asked to put some effort into getting some work, yeah. it's all about the opportunity cost, and that's not just financial. It's in terms of the the effort and business morale and all that kind of thing as well. So um, yeah, all of those apply. You don't. There's no point um, if the if the scale there in terms of effort that you're putting in and the, and the possible reward. If that's tipped you far in the wrong direction, no point doing it. No, no. Ed, any questions on that? No, but we use some, we do some similar stuff. Do you? Yeah, but we tell us, well, I tell us how you want to have yeah. And we do a thing, because there's that many tenders to come through, no, you just got to yeah. And that's all about opportunity cost, isn't it? That one we were talking about the other day. We looked at kind of how much the effort that would have to go in to, so they'd put an RFI out, hadn't they? And kind of the effort that would go into responding to that. And then Gav kind of looked at that specification and the work and the value actually of that work mixed with the chances of winning, not worth doing. Well, we had a chat about that meeting another week, then, and that's all stuff. Well, they were putting, because you've got to watch for tenders that come out as well, because they were putting a tender out that's going to cost a lot of time, effort, and money to put in. And it were going to cost more to put a tender in than it was the contract value would jump. Yeah. And you just think to yourself, why would the pork? Because well, the, the answer to that is because it's very easy for them to put a tender out. That doesn't take them any time at all, has it? So, and the same with you know yeah. the private yeah. sector as well. It's it's no trouble for them to invite people to quickly put out a document, which you know you see all the time. There's errors all through this document. They've just chucked something together and thrown it out. There's no, it's no effort, and also to put an email to you, we really want you to win this, please let us know if you've got any queries. That's really quick and easy for them to do, um, and then you're the ones kind of scurrying around trying to do everything you can to please them. Absolutely, so. it's a bit like if you buy a house. A house is never yours until you've got the key and you're standing <laughs> in the living room. Yeah, so <laughs> and, true. And, and another thing is, the other thing this will do if you adopt that type of thinking is, it will stop you being part of the compare the market Mm -hmm. I've just come up to you for a price, uh, and it, and I've done what with a few, a couple of well, num number of clients now where we've actually reviewed because they used to just bid, mm -hmm. and the bid to win ratio was as you said, Joel, one in ten and mm -hmm. ten plus, 
I know it's one in five, but I'm a bit plus because we've stopped them doing that. We um, one of our mottos is um, bid less, win more. Yeah, because yeah. it really is all about that. Yeah. But it's not about how much sticks at all. You know, it's um, it's about like, really identifying those real yeah. opportunities and then putting maximum effort into it. Because again, like I said, if you um, if you kind of think so often, people say, well, we'll just put something together and send yeah. it off. Don't spend long on it. What is the point of that? Because somebody else in your competition will be spending long on it, um, and therefore it's just a flat out waste of your time. Yeah. Waste of your time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. No problem. Nice to see you again. No thanks. Problem. Thanks for coming along, guys. Just, just to, to, to actually remind you about the incentive. Um, we we kind of called it a kind of grand in your hand and tried to target you to bring ten. Um, and and that's if you want to bring like some more, please feel free to do so. So you um, write your name on it and then give it to the person. Give, give it, and they bring back and then we'll make sure you get it. Cool. Okay. Uh, you say you said the lead one up too. Lead one. We've got a date. But, uh, uh, of the provisional date for each one is the 6th of uh, July for the first one. Yeah. But I'll confirm that early yeah, next week. Okay. So you join it as an organisation? You join it as an organisation. So I, if Signature joined it, then it, uh, obviously Simon will Simon could come over to join it as an organisation, yeah. I think there's a few people that have uh, been enough No, there's been a few, yeah. There's, 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 there's normally more than this. Anyway, thanks for your time. Um, if you want to, if you want to talk to me about this, I'm happy to do so. Um, but as I say, it'll be on the members page as from Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and you can look at it. I'll look it'll be at Tuesday. It's Bank Holiday Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Every day's a holiday. <laughs> um, I would get you to look at the the the, the whole task plan, the whole eight page up. Um, because it will give you questions and things you should be asking. It's almost a, it's not quite an idiot's guide to questions to ask, but we use it for, as I say, we use it for our sales guys. Increased our sales order by by 35% because it just got sales guys not to talk to the IT guy, they to get into the board and, and talk to directors because at some point in the deal, the director is going to want to have a look in your eyes and, and see who you are and what you like. And they tend to get involved right at the start and right at the end. Right at the start to say, yeah, go we'll have a chat with you right then when you hand you the cheque or hand you the contract. Okay, if you want to join us in the bar as normal, we'll happily buy you a drink. Thanks <laughs> for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Okay, thank you. What are you doing, Yeah.